So my name is Wesley McGrew, and to give you a little bit of background on why I might be giving this talk, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the different hats that I wear. So my day job currently is at Mississippi State University, where I've been for some time now, uh, where I teach at the National Forensics Training Center. We develop course material and give, provide free training to anyone affiliated with law enforcement, uh, also wounded veterans that are coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan uh, to give them skills that are needed to uh, join the workforce in uh, processing uh, digital, uh, digital evidence and, uh, and computer crime and child pornography and things like that. So uh, in, that, in that aspect of my job, uh, I, I write about forensics, I teach forensics, we experiment with forensics in our lab. Uh, we have a very nice lab in Starkville, Mississippi for this. Uh, but then after hours, uh, whenever I go home and, uh, and I uh, kick up my feet in the home office, uh, I, I break things. Uh, so uh, I operate McGrewSecurity.com, I'm McGrewSecurity on Twitter, and, uh, and, and one of my favorite things to do is to find vulnerabilities and things, break things, penetration testing, that sort of thing. So uh, with this talk, I'm, I'm sort of uh, being informed by both sides of those things and wanted to provide something for both the uh, forensics geeks and the penetration testing geeks that are in here. So what inspired this talk was, uh, was actually straight out of the DEF CON 19 call for papers. One of the first lines on the kind of talks that they were looking for is uh, James Bond, man from uncle type spy stuff, which is right up my alley. I love any kind of spy movie. I love any kind of heist movie. Basically anything where somebody steals something, I'm, I'm completely cool with that. Very entertaining stuff. So, uh, so that really called out to me, and I'm really happy to see that there's a really huge spy versus spy theme to this conference. It's a lot of fun. Um, so, so with that, I figured, OK, let's get sneaky with uh, forensics and penetration testing. And that's what we're going to do right here in this talk. So to break it down, uh, when we talk about covert post-exploitation forensics, by covert we mean without the suspect's knowledge or the subject's knowledge. Whoever the target of this forensics is, we want them to be able to, uh, to just go about their business as normal without really knowing that we're, we're going after them. So uh, as we'll talk about here in a little bit, um, the, the whole idea with, uh, with traditional forensics is somebody comes and takes your stuff. They, they kick down your door, they, they haul you off, and they take your stuff. Um, with that, you know, you're not going to continue your activities. You're not going to uh, uh, continue to, to steal things and SQL inject folks and, uh, and stuff like that. So uh, we want to be able to have the capability of performing forensics without the suspect knowing about it. So, uh, so that, that brings up some interesting issues, which I'll discuss. Uh, by post-exploitation, we mean that to, co to, to accomplish this covert goal, we want to uh, do this after we've compromised the system remotely or, or by uh, some local backdoor. Any way we can get a interpreter shell up and going uh, works for this. And by forensics, for the folks who are, are not the forensics geeks in the audience, we are reconstructing data above and beyond what the subject anticipates. So uh, the, the subject may be anybody from um, a standard, barely computer literate user who's downloading and trading child pornography over peer-to-peer -peer sites all the way up to, you know, your elite hackers and stuff that, uh, that take lots of operational security into, into account. But uh, between, on the scale from that, from the lowest to the highest skill, there's essentially misunderstandings there as to how data is stored, what's recoverable, what's really deleted and what's really gone, and what can be reconstructed after the fact by a, a good examiner. Uh, and it's all about layers of abstraction. So, so most computer users see, you know, files on their desktop, files in their documents, files in their downloads. They know that when they put something in a recycling bin, they realize they can probably still go and get that back until they empty out their recycling bin. But that's the, that's the level of, of abstraction that they're looking at for, uh, for their system. Uh, and then they're, they're not shown anything else underneath that to, to reveal, you know, how this all really works and how it's all really implemented and why it's so darn fast to delete a one gig file. Um, so so uh, as you get more skilled with this stuff, and especially if you're into forensics and, and, and follow it or, pra or practice it, uh, you begin to realize that the way file systems are implemented is uh, perhaps a bit different than how you see it and interact with it on a daily basis. So when you delete files, they may not necessarily be gone. When you format a file system, that data still might be there. So uh, basically by taking advantage of 
the subject's lack of knowledge of how everything works underneath there, we can pull back things that they thought that they had already gotten rid of. So with that, you know, we've got the peanut butter and jelly sandwich here of forensics and penetration testing. And this is supposed to be something for both sides. So for the forensic side, we're at introducing the aspect of being able to do this remotely and covertly without having to, to be on scene or without having to, uh, to make the subject aware. Uh, and for the penetration testing side of things, we want to make this uh, a tactic that, or a, a, a post-exploitation skill that can be leveraged to, uh, to gather more information out of every system. So uh, we want to be able to, uh, uh, for every system that we break into at a company, we want to be able to extract more data out of it, more personally identifiable information that may have previously been deleted. Uh, more information, old emails and things like that, that may get us into other systems. So, on the forensic geek side of things, so uh, the implications of this is that it, we may run into a situation where it's no subject location, no problem. So for, for the guys that you see running around here with the Guy Fawkes masks on and things like that, they're like, good luck, I'm behind seven proxies. Well, perhaps if uh, you might want to be very careful about the things that you run from here on out and everything, because something like this may give you away. It may allow people to do forensics on your drives and everything without, uh, without you knowing about it. Um, this allows for a surreptitious acquisition and analysis. And so the obvious question here is, is, is of privacy concerns and, and, uh, and the legal uh, ability for or government uh, federal agents and local agents and state agents and things like that to, uh, to perform this kind of analysis. Uh, the way it stands right now is, is there exists surreptitious entry warrants to, to in some situations so that uh, federal investigators can go in uh, surreptitiously and, and, uh, and, and examine things or place things. Uh, it's been used at least once that I know of to place keystroke recorders on a computer. Uh, I believe that was a, a Scarfo or something. It was a mafia uh, organized crime case. So. The, the legal framework may be there. I'm not a, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not, I'm not, I'm barely what you might even consider a Fed, federally funded. Uh, so, so, uh, so I don't know all the details of how to do that, but it's sort of a solution uh, looking for the problem there. But the main thing for the forensics geeks for, for being able to perform forensics on these remote systems like this is that we can use these familiar tools. So uh, if people go to long training events for things like FTK and InCase and things like that, either that or they're, they're very familiar with Brian Carrier's work and they use SleuthKit. And there's no point in having you know, a new set of modules for doing post-exploitation forensics that doesn't work anything like the old ones. And it's best if we can just leverage all that old training. So we can use those familiar tools, uh, SleuthKit, uh, the commercial tools like FTK and InCase. Uh, there's a really good uh, uh, free tool that Access Data, who puts out a forensics toolkit, it uh, publishes called FTK Imager. And it was originally intended as just a way to have a license-free uh, program on a USB drive that can image drives for you so that you can take it out in the field or use it on as many computers as you want. You don't have to worry about having your USB dongle for FTK with you. Well, it's actually kind of grown in capability and grown in capability. It turns out you can do some pretty cool stuff with just FTK Imager. And it's available free from their website, accessdata.com. On the other side of things, uh, if, if, uh, if, if you're a penetration testing geek, if you like to break things, or hey, maybe even if you're a criminal, who knows? Uh, we'll, we'll call it penetration testing. Uh, for, for this side of things, uh, for, you, you might get more value out of the systems that you break into. You may, wanna, uh, you may be able to get more important data out of every compromised system that you break into by using tactics like this, if you suspect that that might be the case. There's always a situation. Uh, uh, for, for companies and organizations and individual systems that process sensitive data, uh, they may need it for a short period of time to verify something or to log it and send it off to some other location to encrypt it and back it up and everything like that. But there's always, you know, the statement there that we don't keep that kind of data. We don't keep sensitive data on this particular system or we don't keep this part of the data. We throw it out and everything and we save the, the stuff that's not sensitive. Or we encrypt that and then back it up over here. So uh, what this will allow you to do is we can take advantage of weaknesses in how they go about that process in order to recover remnants of that sensitive data that, that didn't get deleted quite as well as they thought it would. We may be able to find multiple revisions of files, old data, 
that sort of thing. Uh, uh, any, any kind of remnants of, of old source code or anything like that, say if you built a program on a system, installed it, and then removed the source code from it, well, maybe we can go back and, and pull that back. A big thing that we cover in our, um, in, our, in our forensics training center classes is the concept of data carving. If, if all else is lost, if, if, if everything, if a file has been deleted and all the file system metadata that points to it is gone, uh, there's still a good chance that there are portions or even whole files uh, out there that aren't even pointed to by the, by the operating system. So uh, by doing signature analysis with the headers, basically we know, you know, what, what sequence of bytes a JPEG header starts with, GIF images, Word documents, things like that. If we know that, then we can set up a tool to, to go through every 512 byte sector of that image file or disk and, uh, and look for those old files that aren't being pointed to anymore. Um, one nice thing about uh, the, the tools that I'm going to discuss here is uh, since we're developing tools that, that, that essentially uh, uh, we map the victim's block devices to our local block devices, uh, since we're, we have the capability of doing that, uh, in addition to running off-the-shelf commercial or open source forensics tools, we can also just write our own scripts to manage things. So, uh, so if you have a script that will go through a file system looking for personally identifiable information with regular expressions for or, uh, social security numbers or credit card numbers or anything like that, uh, then you can take those scripts that you would run on your local file system and just run it directly against the file system that you've mounted off of a victim's system. And all this is relatively stealthy with some caveats that we'll discuss. Uh, but, but overall, uh, unless, unless the victim is sharp, uh, then, then it's going to go, go by pretty smoothly. So the typical forensic examination scenarios that you have right now are hardware seizure. You get a warrant and you go out and you take their stuff, basically. Um, in commercial environments, in, in enterprise environments, you may have a situation where you uh, have authorized software agents on the endpoint computer. So if I'm a, a forensic examiner, a forensic investigator for a large company that has, you know, hundreds of machines or thousands of machines, each of those machines may have uh, an in-case agent or a F, uh, an F-response agent on it that uh, allows me to connect to it remotely from my examiner workstation and do some of the same things that we're talking about here, where we're able to uh, we're able to look at the block devices directly, recover files, uh, basically perform examinations remotely. Uh, the difference in this is that we don't have to have that agent anymore. So, uh, remote forensics without having to have the agent, without having to have the click through or sign on on user agreement saying, "Yo, oh, yes, I agree that I may be uh, investigated at any point." Uh, most forensic examinations, uh, if they're not done by, by taking your stuff, then they're done on site. Uh, there are tools for forensic previews. Drives can be quickly hooked up via write blockers and to allow for, um, hooked up via write blockers to allow uh, the examiner on site to see if there's enough evidence there to uh, warrant, you know, taking it with you and, and, and going further with it. Um, sometimes, uh, Consent is given by the uh, by the subject, and um, it, law enforcement are really good about out convincing people to give consent. Uh, so, so a lot of people consent to being searched uh, on on their digital evidence, and uh, the, it can quickly be looked at there. But in all of these cases, the suspect or the subject is aware that they're being investigated. So, uh, here we have a, a situation where that may not necessarily be the case. And take that as you will uh, as being informed. So with the covert remote forensics, we have an unaware subject. Uh, as long as it's a vulnerability in Metasploit or something that you can write a Metasploit module for to, uh, to exploit this system uh, and it doesn't, you know, do crazy things to their desktop while, while it's doing it, which is, you know, the case with most of this stuff, uh, it all works just perfectly fine. Uh, uh, the, the, you, you're in, you get the interpreter shell. The interpreter shell itself has a very low footprint on the system. I don't, I'm not sure that it touches any files at all. It has a small memory footprint. Uh, it probably depends on the uh, actual vulnerability being used as to, as to the footprint. Um, and in this case, if there's no known physical location, it's not a deal killer anymore. You, usually, uh, if, you, if you're going to get a warrant, you want to perform an investigation, a search and seizure, uh, then uh, you need to be able to uh, uh, say where that person is. Uh, but there may be situations where people are, are uh, 
good at anonymizing themselves or coming in over or uh, borrowed wireless and things like that where you may not necessarily know where they physically are. And if you can make the case that, uh, that I know that they're at this IP address and we can get them with this, then, uh, then we can figure out their location once we uh, get onto their system and, and start looking at their data that they have on that system. So in that case, uh, uh, you may have some sort of remote exploit if you have an, if you have an IP address. Or you may uh, do some sort of client side thing and then whenever it phones home to you, it's like, oh, well, there, there, there's the IP address right now. Um, once it calls back to you. Uh, so that gets, you know, all around all seven of those firewalls or proxies. Um, we can have remote imaging. So, so the, the capabilities that this, uh, these tools will allow you to have now uh, uh, are broken up into a few different things. We have three different tools. One's just for enumerating drives. Uh, the other tools, uh, one of them is simply just a remote imaging solution. Uh, just, just the same thing as you would have for a handheld imager or an imaging program like DD on a local computer. This allows you to do essentially the DD process over the network through Meterpreter. Uh, but what's really cool is we have remote block device access. So remote physical drives and remote volumes on the victim Windows computers right now, right now just Windows. Uh, remote devices on those computers, we can map those to local devices that, uh, that we can run any tool we want to on. So this is good for folks who are in intelligence and don't ha really have to worry about the whole warrant thing. Uh, if the NSA wants to talk to me later, they can feel free. I hear they're here. Hiring. Um, there's penetration testers that are trying to up their post exploitation game. So, uh, if you're a penetration tester and, and you want to be able to branch out from your systems more, you want to be able to say in your report, we pulled out more data than, uh, than you normally pull out, uh, this, can, this can help you out here. As far as compliance goes, it could be that, that and I'm not very familiar with, uh, with, with PCI and HIPAA and things like that, but uh, if those standards, uh, if, and other compliance standards, if those standards require the secure deletion of data, uh, then this, these techniques will help you verify that because if you're simply looking at the file system through the normal interpreter, LS, uh, and getting files and things like that, you're looking at that very high level of abstraction that, uh, that keeps, you, uh, keeps you from seeing uh, whether or not something was securely deleted. So uh, we can verify if things have been wiped or not. And finally, uh, criminals can use this. Uh, much like anything that's uh, presented here, uh, if, if, if crime is your thing, then, then, then that's the case. If, if you don't want crime being done against you, then, uh, then this will inform you that you know, maybe people might use it against you. So, uh, so for the forensic side of things here, for the penetration testers, uh, you know, we, at, at Mississippi State University, we have semester-long classes in, in digital forensics. So they, uh, we, we teach them all about file system forensic analysis. We use Brian Carrier's file system forensic analysis book as the textbook. And we cover them with them all the technical details of forensics. We talk, we talk to them about uh, imaging and, and, uh, and some of the legal aspects and things. We, keep, we get uh, law, law uh, professors from uh, Ole Miss to come help out with that. And uh, it's a semester-long class. They, they have a project where they create cases, mock cases, uh, based on a set of parameters we give them. And midway through the class, they swap up and, uh, and investigate those cases. And then we usually have a, a mock trial at the end with, with real judges and attorneys. And we put them on the stand through cross-examination and all that. And it's a lot of fun. Uh, that's, that's forensics on the long end scale of things. It's a semester-long class. For law enforcement and veterans, we have more intense week-long classes that try to get them up to speed for or doing simple examinations and uh, giving them some information so that they can branch out from there or take some of our more advanced courses like the network forensics and uh, some of the workshops that we're holding on commercial and open source tools. But we break those up into the week-long chunks. Now for here at DEF CON, uh, for penetration testers, uh, we have, you know, one hour, less than one hour actually. So, uh, so, so the, to teach you all about forensics is a little bit different. Uh, now, 
I would say that most of our law enforcement and veterans are, are, uh, are a little bit more motivated to learn than most of our undergraduate students. Uh, so I, I would like to think that the penetration testers who want to make more money off of their penetration tests and want to make, have better results would, uh, would be very attentive and willing to do some personal research to uh, get caught up on this. So with file system forensic analysis, we have a whole set of capabilities that are added on that aren't necessarily there with normal tools for looking at file systems like, uh, like the LS and Git and things like that that are built into most exploitation tools. So uh, of course we can get at allocated files and really that's where it stops with, with most uh, post-exploitation tools where we can grab allocated files and we can do things like that, like forensics on their cookies and their browser history and, and uh, grab a copy of their documents folder and things like that. Um, but there's a lot more out there. There's deleted files. So if we delete a file on a file system, then the, typically uh, uh, either on NTFS, uh, that, that file record is simply marked as bad. All the information in the file record is still there. All the data that's out on the disk is still there. Um, if we delete a file on the FAT32 file systems nowadays, mostly used on USB drives and things like that, if we do that, then uh, it simply changes the first character of the file name to mark it as being deleted. But all the information about where that is on the disk is still out there. Uh, there's a really interesting concept of slack space where we can and essentially grab the, the bits and little bits and pieces of old files that are kind of sealed in time, sort of like the mosquitoes in amber from Jurassic Park. Uh, we, can, we can grab out some data on that. I'm going to talk a little bit more detail about that on the next slide. Uh, there's completely unallocated space, so eventually Windows may reuse one of those file records that was marked as deleted, uh, as it will tend to do after some time, a surprisingly long time usually. But uh, once that file record is reused or the disk is reformatted um, or, the, uh, or, or, uh, or there's a partial wipe or something like that, at, uh, then, then the data of the file is perhaps still out there on the clusters in the sectors of the disk and uh, simply nothing's pointing to it. So we're down to data carving. We look for it by signatures, frequency analysis, that sort of thing. Uh, and, and most people have a misunderstanding about the differences between the deleting and formatting and wiping. Uh, essentially, if it didn't take very long for you to do it, then it didn't do it very securely. So uh, uh, it, it takes time to, to wipe a file. It takes time to, to reformat a disk with full wiping. It, it'll take a better part of a day, usually. Um, and, and most file systems don't do this by default. And they don't do it by default because, one, it's very slow and it puts wear and tear on the drives and things like that. And uh, uh, Microsoft takes enough flack for Windows being slow already, and, and they're not going to introduce more slowness by forcing the... Uh, by forcing the user to sit there and wait while every file that's deleted is being wiped off the disk uh, with overwritten zeros and ones and things. And finally, we can, uh, we can uh, have the concept of imaging there, so getting a one-for-one -one copy of the target drive. So with the tools that we're going to show off here, uh, we, we have the ability to, uh, to, to image a remote drive, and if we can do it while the system's relatively calm, if we can get the system in a fairly stable state, Heck, we could just take that image and boot it back up in VMware and have our own very own local copy of the system to work with. Cool. So for Slack space, uh, typically when we have a file, I'll, uh, uh, it's, it's allocated a set of clusters. And the clusters are essentially the way the operating system divides up the sectors of the disk. Every a, a normal hard drive uh, has 512 bytes per sector, and that's the, the smallest addressable uh, uh, unit of, of data that you can kind of pull off at a time. You, you request data sectors or groups of sectors at a time. Uh, the operating system will do one further on that and gather those sectors up into clusters. And it does that so that it can keep a bitmap of which clusters are allocated and which clusters aren't, and it can keep uh, logical pointers to those clusters uh, that it uses to say, okay, this file is in this series of clusters, this series of clusters, and so on and so forth. Well, with this type of system, there is some space wasted at the end of the files. If you have a file that does not end on a cluster boundary, then the rest of that cluster is wasted, essentially. It's, it's sitting there. It doesn't, um, it can't be used by the operating system to, uh, to, uh, to give it to another file or anything like that. It's just simply out there. So 
uh, uh, we have what's called Slack space there. And that Slack space will contain whatever data was in that, those sectors of that cluster before that file was allocated to it. So old files that have been deleted and then, and then uh, brought back, uh, files that have been resized. So uh, you'll see this quite frequently with, with like info2 files and recycling bins. Those info2 files that mark what files have been deleted will grow and shrink. And so you'll see the old contents of an info2 in the Slack space of the current one. Um, in this case, we have two different kinds of Slack here. Uh, there's the RAM slack, which is the remainder of data up until the next sector boundary, which is uh, probably zeroed out. If you're looking at any Windows system past Windows 95B, that's going to be zeroed out because that was historically what, what was containing um, data from RAM. So there would be a 512-byte buffer in RAM that would get written out to disk. And if you're only writing 20 bytes out, if you only put 20 bytes in there, then who knows what's in that rest of that 512 byte buffer. Uh, passwords and crazy stuff from programs in memory. Uh, that being a serious uh, privacy concern, uh, Microsoft uh, and most other modern operating systems have it rigged up to, uh, to zero that out. The remaining sectors in that cluster have the potential goodies. That's, that's old contents of files uh, that are in there, either, either contents of another version of this file or contents from some other uh, file that was on the disk before. So uh, the question is, is, can't we do all this on exploited systems already? And it's true, you can, uh, but it may require loading your forensic tools onto the victim system. Uh, which would probably work, but there's a problem here is anytime we mess with the file system, anytime we load our forensic tools onto these things, we impact it. We may be overriding deleted data. Uh, we're not that stealthy at that point. We have a huge footprint on disk. Uh, and it's a little less elegant than what I'm proposing here. So with Metasploit, with Meterpreter, the, uh, the, the shell that you get whenever you, uh, or if you use the Meterpreter payloads, the shell that you get, um, with Meterpreter, there's a, a, uh, a function or, or some functionality built into Meterpreter called Railgun, which really makes this stuff very easy. Uh, Railgun's by a guy who goes by the name Patrick HEV, uh, dropping, trying to drop docs on him and everything. I can't find anything else about him. I don't know. I guess I could send him an email and, and tell him thanks, but if, if any of you know Patrick HEV and anybody hear Patrick HEV? Five hands, okay. Um, so so uh, if you're out there, massive thanks for making this dead easy. So Patrick HV has an extension from Interpreter Ruby, and basically on your local attacker post-exploitation scripts or post-modules, you can make Windows API calls to the victim's host and get your data right back in your, uh, the return values right back in your, uh, in, your, in your local Ruby script. So basically we can make all sorts of arbitrary Windows API calls locally and just have the results just piped right back to us. So it's awesome for this. If we can call the Windows API remotely, we can access the disk like Windows does. We can access physical and logical, logical block devices directly, as long as we have permissions to do so, uh, which means we can read arbitrary sectors from the disk. And then really, that, from that point on, that's all you need to do forensics. If we can say, I want that sector, I want that sector, then, then we're good. We can start traversing out the master file tables and things like that and uh, get at it. So why not make this really dead easy and map those remote block devices to local ones? So we have three tools for that. Uh, enum drives, which uh, uh, simply lists out the physical drives and, and volume so you know what you're playing with. Uh, there's an imager that does byte for byte imaging, hashing, split images, all sorts of things that you would expect out of uh, normal forensics tools. Uh, for imaging DD, uh, image masters, and, and, uh, and talons and things like that, all of your handheld imagers. It can do all this sort of stuff. But the coolest part of this is nbdserver.rb. Now, all of this stuff should be in the Metasploit SVN right now. Uh, it was supposed to be in there a couple days ago for my Black Hat talk. I've been kind of avoiding the internet around here, so, uh, so uh, somebody else can verify this for me. But if you do an SVN update, along with all the back doors that the guys here are injecting, uh, you might get these tools as well. Uh, if not, then I'll make sure that they're available. Uh, with NBD server, uh, you can run your forensics tools locally on local block devices that are mapped to remote block devices. The way we do this is through a dirty, dirty hack. Uh, I didn't feel like implementing my own block device drivers or anything like that. But there's a protocol in Linux called NBD, which is a really dead easy protocol 
uh, to get programmatic block devices. So you can implement your own block device in code and just have it listening over TCP locally or remotely or whatever you want to do really. Uh, so with NBD we can, uh, we can map these things to local block devices that we can then do reading with. And the way this code works, the way that it works as distributed, there's only read only, a there's only read only access. So uh, uh, essentially we're write blocking too, so we don't, we have a minimal impact on the host. So now we can have direct access with open, so open source tools in Linux. Uh, so this is just essentially a diagram of how it all works out. We have uh, the disk, interpreter talks to it through the Win API. Uh, Metasploit talks from interpreter and uh, locally we have Railgun uh, making those uh, Railgun calls through the Windows API. We map dev nbd0 through nbd to that disk on the target and we run our forensics tools on it. And this works good for Linux tools because as nbd is supported in Linux and everything and so this is good for sleuth kit and all but for Windows uh, I was a bit of, and I was kind of stumped. I was like well I'm going to have to write a Windows block device driver or something like that to get this working in there. And then a couple of weeks ago, uh, preparing our, my slides for this talk and everything, I came up with, with a good stupid protocol trick to get this working in, in Windows very well. Uh, and that stupid protocol trick is to use iSCSI. So iSCSI is a little bit more complex of a protocol for block devices. But as it turns out, if I get an MBD block device in Linux, I can then map that as an iSCSI target in Linux and then have a Windows machine connect to that and treat it as a block device. So we have this stupid protocol trick where we're going over iSCSI, NBD, Interpreter, Windows API and straight back from there to the disk. So the problems here, uh, you're going over a network so your mileage may vary. If it's uh, uh, around the world and over you know, a phone line or something like that then it's going to be slow. And, uh, and on the other hand, if it's a very fast network that you're doing this over, you may be able to get a lot of response out of it, but you may not be so stealthy at that point because you're, you know, pushing gigs of traffic over this thing. Uh, you may actually want to modify the code of this to, to uh, try to uh, throttle it if that's a problem. Uh, on this, uh, it's possible that there's a good cleaner cross-platform implementation of this. Maybe instead of using NBD directly in Ruby, we... Uh, make our own Ruby iSCSI target that we can use. How hard could it be? Uh, for the conclusions for this, if you're a pen tester, go out there and wring some more data out of the systems that you break into. Uh, if you're a criminal, you know, get caught. Uh, <laughs> But from this we can build capability for forensic examiners and penetration testers and we can encourage people to do use more secure wiping for their data. And from that now we're going to roll into our demos real quick right, like right here. We're going to uh, see how much of this we can get through. We're going to see if all three of my VMs will behave. If not then I'll just go back to the ferret. Uh, all right. You'll have to forgive me. I have some notes here on, on uh, exactly how my demo goes. To introduce you to the actors in this demo, we have we have our uh, our victim over here running an uh, unpatched Windows XP Service Pack Three. I'm I'm not on the wireless network right now, so don't even try. Um, <laughs> this thing is is vulnerable to uh, probably who knows how many things in Metasploit. We have our attacker here. Oh, get out of my way, forensics machine. Uh, we have our attacker here running Metasploit, uh, which we're going to uh, point at this thing. Uh, Metasploit here has, was updated 18 days ago. Metasploit 4 is out. Uh, I didn't want to update on here for fear of breaking my demo. Uh, and over here we have a forensics machine uh, running Windows 7. We have access data FTK imager on. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that my victim didn't hop IP addresses on me. And we should be good. Yep, still sitting there right where I left it. Thankfully, no lol sec images up on it or anything. That's good. All right, so we're going to use, you know, one of my favorite exploits of all time. You ever have a favorite exploit that, you know, just always works? MS08067, that's the run. That's the one right there. All right. And we're going to set our payload. Let's zoom in a bit here. Oops. Windows interpreter bind TCP. The tab completion sometimes takes a little while. All right, so we set our payload up. We're going to set our remote host. 
Oops. That 93, that 155, right where I left it. And we're going to hit it. And big surprise, not quite zero day, and we have success. All right, so we're in. Now, any vulnerability would work for this. Any, any exploit, if you got some zero day to drop into a Metasploit, feel free. Substitute is necessary. I'm keeping all my zero day. Um, so for this, we're going to run some of these post modules here. We're going to run the, oops. Run. Post windows gather. Gather. Enum drives. And that's going to list out the one physical drive that's on that VM, a 40 gig physical drive, as well as the logical drives that are there. So if that drive is partitioned out into multiple drive letters, then it tells us about it. It also tells us the disks that are inserted. That's, that's actually, I think, the DEF CON CD that's in the DVD drive there. Um, and now we map it to a block device. So we run the NBD server. And we tell it we want the C drive. So now for this, we have the backslashes window style. You can do that in the interpreter shell, but you have to escape them. The forward slashes work just as well, and you don't have to escape them. So much easier to do that. So now we have an NBD server listening. And over here, we can uh, take a look that at that. Uh, we can connect to that NBD server. So we run NBD client. Local host, I'm running on port 10,005, and we want to map it to dev nbd0. So we've got that mapped, and now we can just take a look at it very quickly and verify that we are indeed looking at an NTFS disk here. So there's your partition boot record. And the next, for my next trick, we're going to mount that device directly. So now we can mount read only that device to a little mount point that I have here for my victim. And it takes it a moment to do that. So a lot of the stuff that you're doing with the uh, remote forensics like this isn't the fastest stuff in the world. Uh, it's not nearly as responsive as, as working over a normal SATA cable. Some things take longer than others. This mount command took a while and tried to embarrass me during my black hat talk. Uh, but with that, we can go into our victim and go into his documents and settings. Victim is his username even. He's, he wasn't very holding out very high hopes. Uh, we can go to his desktop folder, and there is a document full of personally identifiable information. We can, uh, how do I know that? There you go. And if you're, you know, wanting to take cell phone pictures and stuff, don't bother. It's all from fakenamegenerator.com. All right, so uh, now we can run tools uh, all on this device as well, so uh, we can unmount that now. We can run forensic tools like NTFS, delete, undelete, uh, which is, you know, normally you'd want to use something like SleuthKit for this, but uh, this is kind of built in and quick and easy. So we can undelete any, uh, let's delete something first. See if it'll work. Actually, let's just, Try undeleting CSVs. I did delete a CSV that was on here, and we'll see if it finds it. If it doesn't, we'll just move on. While that's working, uh, because that's going to take a moment, we're going to start up a new tab here and start showing you the iSCSI capabilities here. So with iSCSI, we have, et cetera, IET, ietd.conf, and we have a, oops, sudo make me a sandwich. Attacker. So here we have this thing, this block device mapped to an iSCSI target. On the Windows side of things, okay, so it didn't find any deleted files there, so that's fine there. We'll move on. On the Windows side of things, we can load up the iSCSI initiator, which is a buggy piece of crap, but it does work. 
I would hate to use this for anything other than leet hacks because uh, relying on this for enterprise stuff would probably really suck. Um, let's see, 93.163 is my attacker. So quick connect to that and cross your fingers, guys, and hope this works. Ooh. Oh, I need to start the iSCSI service. That would help. Init.d, iSCSI, start. All right, now we should, now we should be cooking with gas. 168.93.163. Come on. Connection failed. Let's start that up again. We'll give it one more chance here and then we'll call it a wash. Make sure my IP address haven't hopped over here. Oh, 164, you little bastard. Sneaky, just a moving target there. So here we are, we're connected. So now we have a block device that we can use an FTK imager or any, any of your favorite forensics tools at this point. File, add evidence item. And you can image these things, you can mount the images and, and use them in virtual machines, that sort of stuff. So we'll do it as a physical drive and point it to physical drive one, which is the virtual disk over iSCSI, moving over interpreter, moving over a million other protocols. And it takes this dandy time loading up, but it's a miracle it even works. And so speed improvements to this would be beneficial. Uh, we might implement some, not chaining iSCSI and NBD would probably help matters. Oh good, FTK image are not responding now. Oh, here it comes back. Just had to take its time. So now we have the physical drive here. We can navigate around this thing. We can look at unallocated space. We can uh, run various and sundry undelete tools and, uh, and uh, any kind of scripts you have and uh, get all the nice emails that they deleted. So with that, uh, that basically concludes my talk. Uh, we're going to be moving over to the question and answer room two, which is approximately four or five miles around this whole thing. Uh, and uh, I'll answer any questions there. Thank you.